Hi, everybody. My name is Paul Golan. I am executive director of the Society for Humanistic Judaism. And this is our monthly uh, Rabbi and Cantor series called Life, the Universe, and Humanistic Judaism. And today we are thrilled to have Rabbi Jeremy Crydell with us, and I'm going to introduce him in a moment. But first, if this is the first time that you're joining us, this is a program for the members of the Society for Humanistic Judaism, whether you're a member of SHJ directly or you're a member of one of our affiliated communities. We have 32 affiliated communities in the United States and Canada. And one that is global because it's online, the Spinoza Chavra. And so we welcome you and we appreciate you being here. And this is an opportunity for you to meet the clergy, uh, our leadership from across our movement and hear what's on their mind. And we've had some really interesting, fascinating conversations and um if you have missed them and you want to catch up, they're all on our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and search Society for Humanistic Judaism, you'll find a playlist of this series. I think this is the 10th session that we've done. So um, we appreciate you being here and we're excited for this session. And let me give you a bit of background about Rabbi Jeremy Crydell. Um, rabbi Crydell joined Mahar as rabbi in July 2017 and added the role of director of Mahar's Jewish Cultural School in 2021. Jeremy studied for the rabbinate at the International Institute for Secular Humanistic Judaism. He has a bachelor's and master's of arts degree in religion from Florida State University, where he focused on Jewish studies and biblical interpretation, and earned a Juris Doctor degree at the Indiana University Maurer School of Law in Bloomington, Illinois, Indiana. Jeremy has worked as an adult Jewish educator, has taught biblical Hebrew at the university level, and has taught seventh graders on the Holocaust, the history of the modern state of Israel, and comparative Judaism. Before working within the secular humanistic Jewish movement, he worked as a lawyer in Indiana and taught law at the Indiana University Kelly School of Business in Indianapolis. In service of the broader humanistic Jewish movement, Jeremy serves on the governing boards of the Society for Humanistic Judaism and the International Institute for Secular Humanistic Judaism, and has served as president of the Association of Humanistic Rabbis. He served as the editor for SHJ's quarterly Humanistic Judaism magazine. He is also an accomplished musician, a husband, father, lots more things. So if you don't know him yet, I'm happy to finally introduce you to him. And I'm going to remove my spotlight and spotlight Jeremy and turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. So you tuned in to presumably learn about humanistic Judaism and pluralism. And I don't know if I have lessons to impart, but I have a story to impart that I guess is a nice starting point. Um, so... About a year and a half ago, um, as part of a longer story that also involves COVID, I was recovering from open heart surgery and continued to get a call from one of my colleagues in Howard County. So we live in Howard County, which is between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Um, and I kept getting a phone call from one of these colleagues on the Howard County Board of Rabbis. And that sounds very fancy until you realize it's the same five of us in a room over and over and over again. It's a little bit bigger than that, but there's not that many people that show up. It's a small county. We're between Washington and Baltimore. You know, we don't have a bank account even. Um, so I keep getting a, this phone call from him and I keep not answering because I'm not really ready to answer the phone. And when I do eventually answer the phone, he says, so you saw that I'm the interim rabbi at this congregation in the DC area, Kahila Harashah. Yeah. Well, for those who don't know what an interim rabbi is, think rabbi managerial consultant. They've been doing rabbi work for a while. This is a thing that gets done near retirement where you sort of are temporarily at congregations and your job is to kind of clear the deck, get them ready for their next long-term rabbi. He says, so I'm the interim at this congregation and we're a lot 
like your congregation in terms of size, in terms of size of the school, et cetera. You want to do something together? And the do something together was not very specific yet. And this particular congregation has its roots in, to the extent it has roots in a movement, in the renewal movement. Um, its longtime rabbi was ordained by um, Reb Zalman. So it, it, it has that ethos, even though it's also purposefully not affiliated with anything. So he says, you know, but we, we should, let's see if we can do something. And what we set upon initially was, we'll try to combine one class of our schools. And for whatever reason, the thing that seemed to make the most sense was the seventh grade year where they're heading toward B-Mitzvah. Um, that didn't work for a number of reasons. And what ended up happening was we agreed we'd combine our second and third grade class. Everybody else is just going to be doing their thing. And circumstances being what they were, we actually ended up combining everything from fifth grade down. So our sixth grade and seventh grade classes were separate, but everything else got combined. This involved Mahar leaving the building that we had been using for a long time, um, which was a Jewish day school and joining up with Kahila Hadasha at a local public school. And that really was going to be the extent of what we were going to do was the second, third grade class. And I don't know if you've tried to hire anybody recently, but it's not a great market for hiring Sunday school teachers set aside hiring Sunday school teachers who work in humanistic congregations, because that starts to, you know, you really do start to thin the pool. Um, so neither of us were able to fill in our teaching staff. So we just kind of combined a bunch of stuff. And at the same time, our adult ed groups were getting together and there's only one flexible use room in the building, the cafeteria. So, okay, now we're going to combine adult ed programs. And this eventually grew to this year when we've combined the schools fully at every grade and pulled in still another congregation. Um, and we'll get back to that other congregation in a second. So it's a renewal congregation, renewal-ish congregation. Mahar is a humanistic congregation. And despite those differences, the people are pretty much the same. This is the DC area. Everybody works in government, law, or nonprofit, uh, unless they happen to be a psychologist. For some reason, Makar's got a bunch of psychologists. I can't figure that one out. Um, we have one doctor, we have no CPAs. So, you know, it, it's a, it's not the profile that I imagined as a congregational rabbi, um, particularly the no CPAs, but I have family members who are CPAs. So I take that maybe too seriously. Um, but they're the same people. Their level of personal observance of Jewish traditions is different, um, but not much. And really what's different for day-to-day -day purposes are what people are saying over Shabbat candles. Um, so we sort of combined what we were doing and it worked pretty well after we had a month long, are you going to try to merge the congregations panic? Um, and it was a full on panic and we lost at least one family because of those concerns. Um, and we get to Simchat Torah and Mahar has never done anything for Simchat Torah, but they have done, a, they dance with the Torahs and everything. So our second and third graders got to see that without participating necessarily. Um, we got to Hanukkah, and this is sort of where the real learning starts. We got to Hanukkah, and we had to figure out how to put these two groups in the same place for Hanukkah. And what we ended up 
doing was there was one stage and I and Rabbi Gordy Fuller, the rabbi for Kehillah Hadashah, were both on the stage and we both did our community's respective sets of Hanukkah and Havdalah blessings. It was a Saturday night, so Havdalah then Hanukkah. Um, and that was not the best choice. And we can come back to why that was not the best choice, but that was not the best choice. Um, but that didn't really sabotage the school programs, which made their way through the rest of the year. We did Passover separately. We did Purim together, but no one says anything prayer-wise for Purim. Nobody even read a Megillah. Like it was all plays, um, all fun and games. Um, we did Passover separately, which we were always going to do. We did our high holidays separately. And as we got to the end of the school year, my school director colleague at Kahila Hadasha was reached out to by another rabbi in the DC area who said, I hear you're doing this joint school thing. We're probably really not gonna have enough students to have a school. Can we join you? The congregation in question is named Beth Chai. 48 years ago or so, maybe 47, Beth Chai is the organization that formed as the first humanistic Jewish congregation in the DC area. And about eight years after that, a traditional mourner's Kaddish was used during high holiday services, at which point one of the founding members of Mahar as a separate group walked out of the room sent a letter to everyone in the congregation explaining why he had walked out of the room. And very soon, a lot of the founding members at Beth Chai founded Mahar. So these are congregations with a 40 odd year history of eyeing each other across the Potomac suspiciously. Uh, Beth Chai does everything and does everything, everything in Maryland and uh, Mahar is incorporated in DC. So. I don't know, maybe it's Cabin John Creek. There's some, there's some body of water that we were eyeing each other suspiciously over. Um, we had in the, like right around 2019, tried to make inroads to just talking to the folks at Beth High and doing things with them. And they did not have the time of day for us um, until 2024 at which point they had to have the time of day for us because we were the other half of the school collaboration. So we brought them in and this year we have in one place, three different congregations that have combined their kids' schools, none of which were probably gonna be viable on their own. But together there's about 70 kids. Um, they're doing a lot of joint adult ed things and what we don't do jointly, for the most part, is um, the quote unquote, I'm going to use this word, um, I can justify it academically, you'll just not like it, quote unquote, religious stuff, right? High holidays and all of that kind of thing. Um, we don't do those jointly. We actually have memoranda of understanding that govern how ceremonial stuff works. So there's kind of that piece of doing what is almost interfaith work because the folks at Kehila Chandashah do not get us a lot of the time. Like, we, you don't, we can't say Baruch Atah Adonai. Well, you can, but we don't want to be in the room for it. Um, the other part of this is I just spent two years as the chair for the Howard County Board of Rabbis. I am the only humanistic rabbi in Howard County. If you are looking for one, I'm it. Um, I have a number of colleagues who are reform, one or two colleagues who are conservative, one or two colleagues who are reconstructionist. There are Chabad rabbis in town, but Chabad rabbis don't hang out with us. Um, 
both because they're sort of not allowed to, and also because we're not rabbis as far as they're concerned. Um, and there are cantors and cantorial soloists and things like that kind of hanging around. Um, but imagine the difficulty involved in being a humanistic rabbi and then October 7th happens. And then you need to have a communal day where people are getting together to mourn and to start to think about recovery and raising funds and all of that other stuff. And what do you, as a humanistic rabbi who is the chair of the Howard County Board of Rabbis and therefore has to talk at the community-wide thing with a thousand people, what do you say? How do you how do you thread that needle? Because no one is expecting you to walk up and start not talking about God. You're a rabbi. You're supposed to talk about God, right? So there's a whole series of interesting things that happen when you do that. Um, so I'm not saying I'm a font of wisdom on pluralism or anything like that, but I can definitely talk a lot about how can you negotiate that as a humanistic Jew in terms of just your personal stuff? How do you navigate that when you're thinking about making congregations work? What's the value of having clergy around? Um, because this doesn't happen, the school thing doesn't happen if you don't have somebody that's recognizable clergy to the outside Jewish world because they don't know who you are and they're not interested anymore. So that stuff I have some ability to talk about. For those of you who are looking at me and my face is really big and you see I have these pink fingers, there's nothing wrong with my fingers. I'm a fountain pen user. And I was cleaning fountain pens messily. So don't worry about the pink. The pink is fine. The pink's supposed to be there. It'll be gone in a couple of days. And yeah, I really do use fountain pens. That's not an affectation. Can I can I jump in with questions? Yeah. All right. Because at first, though, I thought with your fingers that you had like just voted in an election in Iran or something like that. <laughs> but um, well, I love the the um, the story, and it gets at a lot of aspects of the difference between humanistic Judaism and the other denominations, and how to maintain that and also what the role is. So just to kind of fill in some of the stuff that you didn't know, I want to ask a couple of questions. What did you do in that moment for the uh, October 7th um, presentation? I presume it was within days after October 7th? Uh, yeah, it was October 10th or 11th. Uh -huh. um, so it was pretty quickly. Um, and what I ended up talking about was you know, there are people who are wrapped up in this who are innocent victims and are going to need support. And it's our role as a Jewish community to help other Jews when they're in distress. Um, so I didn't talk about God. I, why would I, I mean, I, right, like, I'm not going to try to pray for anybody that doesn't work. Um, so I didn't talk about God, but I did talk about our role as a Jewish community helping another Jewish community, um, which is from a humanistic Jewish perspective, appropriate and on point in terms of the things that we believe and talk about doing, um, but also tries to um, reinforce the cultural connections with all of these other denominations and with um, Israeli Jews who don't necessarily have a whole lot to do with the diaspora, but are still Jews, right? That's the tradition is you help Jews. So we help Jews and my political limits are just a lot different from my colleagues. You won't find me at an APAC convention. And, you know, you because you mentioned threading the needle, we we have the full gamut of political opinions in our movement. So I appreciate that. Um, and, and the next question I was going to ask 
um, Martin actually did put into the chat, you had said that it was not a good idea to do both the theistic and non-theistic liturgy back and forth during a Hanukkah program. Why was that? Um, a lot of folks who join humanistic congregations join humanistic congregations so that their Jewish life reflects humanistic Judaism. And Baruch HaTah Adonai does not reflect humanistic Judaism for them, even if it's not me saying it. So if we're in the same room, we're both on the same stage, and literally what we're doing is taking a microphone. I'm doing the humanistic ones. Gordy's doing the traditional ones. And we say what we're doing, right? We're very intentional about Mahar is going to do its stuff first, but Kahila Harasha is going to do their stuff second. But there's still somebody at the front of the room on a stage at something that isn't a broad Jewish community event saying traditional blessings for the group. And some folks were fine with it. And some folks were very not fine with it. And it did cause a lot of, uh, we'll call it heated discussion on our congregation's listserv. To the extent that when I said, we're thinking about revising the High Holiday Liturgy, would anybody like to help? I got an email from someone saying, I was going to send this to the listserv, but I didn't. What's the point of doing this if we're just going to merge with them at the end of the year and we're all going to be saying religious stuff anyway? So in theory, it should be fine. And if you go to a protest, this kind of thing works. But when it's a community's Hanukkah celebration, even if it's working with a community that it knows is more traditionally aligned, it doesn't work for everybody. And where uh, Rabbi Fuller and I thought, oh, well, you know, we'll both be represented. Yeah, that wasn't the right place for we'll both be represented. Got it. I think that's a really important point that I want to hang on to because, you know, so, so the word pluralism, and if folks aren't familiar with the way that it's used in the Jewish community, so... Um, I think before we, we started, I had mentioned before I came to SHA, I worked at an organization that was trying to be pluralistic. And what it meant was serving the entire gamut of the organized Jewish community, all of the denomination, including humanistic Judaism. We are on one end of the spectrum, I think it's fair to say. And, you know, to orthodoxy on the other end of that kind of religious or belief spectrum. And um, it's hard to do that and make everyone feel comfortable. And especially if you actually do include our end of the spectrum. What I found in doing the work was that pluralism in the organized Jewish community really meant from Orthodox all the way to like Reconstructionism and that humanistic Judaism often is not included in pluralistic settings. And when we, when we launched Jews for Secular Democracy, uh, five years ago now and purposely made it a pluralistic initiative, the goal was not only to engage Jews beyond our movement, but to make sure that our voice was at that table as humanistic Jews, that it was a genuinely pluralistic space. So if Federation, for example, which claims to be a pluralistic umbrella in almost every Jew, you know, city in the U.S. that has a Jewish community of any size has is covered by an umbrella organization called Jewish Federation. If they do a Hanukkah program um, and they include both the traditional and a humanistic blessing, that would be a huge win for us. That would be incredibly inclusive. And you know, I would love to see that happen more. And I have seen moments of it. I saw Hillel International put something up on Instagram and they included both a the traditional and a humanistic version of a blessing. And I've seen it done by uh, PJ Library, which is a pluralistic group that, that sends free kids, Jewish kids books to families. 
Um, so I've seen it pop up every so often, and it's nice to be included in that way. But I can understand that in what you are describing, these are folks who feel like they're coming to an event of their community, right? This is not a community-wide event. It is my community's event. And so when I talk about like Jews for a Secular Democracy, for example, I say it's an initiative of, it's a pluralistic initiative of SHJ. Humanistic Judaism is not pluralistic. We're not. We are not a big tent. My former organization was called Big Tent Judaism. Humanistic Judaism is not a big tent. We're here to serve humanistic Jews, but we are part of the big tent of the Jewish community. And if you genuinely want to have a big tent Jewish community, then you have to have humanistic Jews represent. So it's this really tough balance. So I appreciate that you've identified a place where it doesn't work, which is that you were saying to your community, come to our community's Hanukkah program. And then they heard the things that basically most of us are fleeing from. Um, but that said, you are also identifying, I think, some times when it does work. Is that correct that you do have examples of when it did work? Yeah. Um, Purim is a time where it, it did work, right? Um, no one read a Megillah. I'm not even sure that anybody brought a Megillah, right? The, the scroll that has the Book of Esther on it. Like a few verses were chanted in the traditional trope, and a few verses were read aloud, and then everything else was Purim spiels. Purim spiel by the kids, Purim spiel by the adults, Purim carnival afterward. So, Nobody was invested in traditional blessings. Everybody was invested in having fun. It worked. A lot of the adult education stuff works. Um, it also works when you say, we are doing our humanistic Passover Seder. If you'd like to come, you can come. And people who are members of that group, who are the other group who are interested, come. That works. We did a Havdalah together at one of our board members' homes, where we invited the folks from Kehillah Hadashah to come. They came. We did the humanistic version of Havdalah. It worked. They understood, okay, we're visiting. By the same token, there, was, there were a couple of things they invited us to. We understood we were visiting. You're going to hear the traditional blessings in that context. Okay, it works because you know what you're walking into. Had we said, we're both going to be on stage and Rabbi Jeremy is going to do the humanistic blessings and Rabbi Gordy is going to do the traditional ones. Maybe people would have been upset, but they also wouldn't have felt surprised and they could have made a choice. So, there are probably other things we could have done that would have at least made it a little bit easier for some folks to do or to accept that we had decided to do it this way. Got it. I have one more question and then I'll, I'll open it up to everyone. And this has been on my mind since I took this role and I don't know that there's an easy answer and I have been working on lots of other things to not give it enough of my attention, but I guess this is a question about educational philosophy because I have heard feedback from a couple of folks who grew up in our movement and were um, not isolated, but ev you know, any community that you grow up in is what you think everything is in the world, right? And then when you get out into the wider world, especially the Jewish communal world, where 98% of the Jews are using a different language for their blessings on Hanukkah or whatever. And I've heard from folks who grew up in our movement who said they were shocked when, like, whether it was at a friend's bar mitzvah or later at Hillel, Hillel events or Birthright Israel or whatever, when they're, you know, in their teenage years or early 20s and they get uh, exposed to the wider Jewish community and they see that certainly on things like the Shema, Everyone in the room knows it, and they don't. And they and and the, at least one person I heard from said they'd never heard it before, and that it was embarrassing. And that was surprising to me. And I think there's a tension between folks 
like me, and I don't know what the breakdown is in our movement, but I do think that even today, a majority of humanistic Jews, and I mean official members, grew up in another denomination or none, as opposed to grew up in humanistic Judaism. We do have second and third and maybe even fourth generation humanistic Jews now, which is great, but I still don't think that's the majority of who our community is. So I grew up conservative. I know what I'm rejecting. I'm very familiar with the traditional liturgy, and I try to avoid it at all costs. Um, and I resent when I can't av avoid it, like at my cousin's kid's bar mitzvahs. But I go anyway because it's family. But um, I'm actually glad. And uh, I, w I will say that my very, I think, first week on the job, I got to go here. Rabbi Miriam Jarrett talked to the community in Connecticut, and um, we were talking about this, right? And I was going to say, I'm glad that I had that Jewish education to reject. Um, and she, but she had said, she said to this group, I'm paraphrasing, but she basically said, in what other areas do you make your kid get an education in the hopes that they will reject it, right? Do you give them piano lessons in the hope that they will hate playing piano? Of course not, right? It's, it's so backwards, but so many Jews like continue, like th there's an expression of like, I hated Hebrew school and you will too. And that's how we just keep this thing going, right? Which is absurd. So I, I'm not knocking our approach in any, by any means, but I'm wondering, at, you know, and I do think some of our communities explain this is the Shema as done traditionally, and this is how we revise it. Like, is there a conversation, and at what age do our kids begin to understand that we've revised the liturgy? Do they learn about Jewish liturgy? Do, are they made familiar? I think some of our other communities also, I think in Chicago, they go visit other denominations, congregations, so that they're at least um, prepared for the difference when they are then put into pluralistic settings. Is that something that you, you do at Makar? Is it part of the conversation? Um, I am sus I suspect that there are probably Makar board members who are tired of hearing me say this phrase. There is no Rabbi Jeremy at Hillel. Um, there's no me, right? There's no Makar. You're at Bryn Mawr and there's maybe not even a full Hillel. Or you are at Columbia, where sure, city congregation is nearby, but you're not going to city congregation. You're a college student. You're going to go to Hillel or um, Judaism on our own terms, which is the successor to Open Hillel. That's where you're going to go. So I make a point to find a way, typically around sixth or seventh grade, to spend time talking about this is the structure of the thing you're going to see when you go to your cousin's bar mitzvah this is the structure of the thing you're going to see when you go to a funeral or to somebody's house when you're visiting for shiva right there's this thing called the amidah it's the centerpiece of the prayers although actually most people don't really know what's in the amidah and they kind of zone out when they get to that or they just read it in english and have no idea what's happening in the english either because those translations are so dense they're going to know the Shema. Here's what it sounds like. You've heard us do the humanistic Shema when you've come to our high holiday services, but you didn't really realize what we were doing. Right? So that is a piece that I think has to be taught because I don't want people going out into the broader Jewish world and being surprised and not knowing what's happening around them. They may not be able to follow along. And to be really fair, if you got my Hebrew school education, you could follow along with the Hebrew in terms of saying it aloud, but you didn't know what any of it meant, which is probably what most people get outside of the Orthodox world. And I bet in the Orthodox world, this happens too. And there are reports that sometimes Jewish day schools don't produce kids who actually know very much Hebrew either. So we shouldn't pretend like Jewish day schools a penis, uh, it fixes this problem either. They can follow along with the sound, but they can't follow along with what it means. Our students end up being able to know what's happening, follow along with what it means, 
but they could not daven the service, right? They can't, they're not going to be able to put on a talit and a kippah and stand there and shuckle, right? The back and forth and the stepping and the moving that happens during the Amidah, right? They're not going to do that. They won't know that. They won't be able to do that. But they will have a sense for at least the basic meaning of what's on the page in front of them. If only because when I introduce this stuff, I introduce it with Monty Python's The Meaning of Life, which if you've seen that movie, there's a scene where all of these boys in a prep school are in chapel. And there's some guy up at the front who's just rambling on and on and on. And the prayers are, oh, God, you are so big. We're all really impressed down here, I can tell you. Because our students have never read the prayers and they don't know what they say. And it turns out that, uh, you know, Saturday morning services at your typical conservative shul are five hours of that. Interrupted by Torah reading. They should know what's happening around them. So that's that does happen. I'm not going to teach anybody to to pray, but they should know what's being said. Great, thank you. Um, if folks want to use the hand icon, if you have a question that you want to ask, you can put your hand up, either using that icon or just raising your hand if you're on video. And if you're really lucky, your Zoom will translate your hand doing that into the yellow hand being does raised. Does it do sometimes that? It, yeah, sometimes it does that. If you move your hands around, it does fireworks sometimes. And yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. I haven't been able to keep up with the written chat. So if, if you chatted something and you want to ask it, please. And I know I saw someone mention that they're in Indianapolis and there's nothing. And I do want to say that while we lived in Indianapolis, we we actually did try to get something started. Um, and we had a few good events. But you discover that starting a new community is a lot. And we moved. And that was kind of the other part of why there isn't something in Indianapolis. Although Indianapolis does have another tie to humanistic Judaism. Um, Rabbi Peter Schweitzer, who passed away recently and was the longtime rabbi at City Congregation, his first professional pulpit was in Indianapolis at Indianapolis Hebrew Congregation 40-odd years ago. Diane? Um, I, um, I'm a member of Kol Shalom in Portland, Oregon, um, although I live in Wisconsin now. Um, and I, I was um, involved in our children's education when we had a larger uh, congregation. Um, there, there, I did hear from one family, uh, close friends, um, they said they, they would not want their grandchildren to go to our school because they would be lost in a traditional Jewish setting. So that is what you were just mentioning. Um, for me, uh, and this is slightly on a different tack, but for me, it's the music uh, from the traditional um, services that that do something for me. And, um, and I wish that, I mean, I think, I, I do not like Sherwin Wine's um, Afoori. Is it Afoori? I think that I'm that I'm thinking of. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and I I love the uh, traditional um, music for Sh Shema. Um, I don't know. I just wish there were a way we could bring that music in. And um, yeah, okay, that's all. Yeah. So this is a right. This is a problem. Let's be honest about it. For a lot of people, this is the difficult thing. And I was buttonholed by a family after high holiday services this year. They've been a member for several years. Their kids are in the school working with their with their elder child on their B'nai Mitzvah project. We're studying a page of Talmud together. Like, you know, they're an engaged family. They know what we do. And I still got buttonholed. Could we maybe sing the traditional one and the humanistic one at Maharno, 
<laughs> Beth Chai <laughs> exists because that's what they wanted to do, but they're not members of Beth Chai. They know Beth Chai exists. Their kids are in school with Beth Chai students. They're Mahar members. And so, yeah, missing the music is a, a big thing. And you can bridge some of that gap by adapting what exists with changed words. Yeah. It requires sometimes a lot of work. You can't save everything. A lot of people just love the traditional Aleinu, Aleinu pray, right? Aleinu l'shabeach. There's no adapting the Aleinu. The whole prayer is, there's going to be an end time and it's going to be great. And that is, I mean, there may be an end time, but it's not going to be great, right? Because if we do the end time, it's us inflicted and that's not going to be a, it's an inflicted thing. Um so it is a thing that's missing. And sometimes you can bridge the gap by adapting words or by really largely rewriting something to use a traditional tune, but it doesn't scratch everybody's itch. And there have been a few families who, we belong to Mahar because we agree with the Mahar stuff. We're going to send our kids through Mahar's B Mitzvah program. And then a year later, they're a member of a conservative synagogue because I can hear a Vinu Malkainu that way, right? That's what they want to do. They want to hear the traditional Avinu Malkainu or the traditional Shema or whatever it is. It's hard to hit all of that. I will be really honest, I'm not a huge fan of Afo Ori either. Um, it's something that people, it's a known joke at Mahar. Um, we're changing the tune and trying things out. And sometimes changing the tune really does help um, for some folks, but not for everybody. And there are a lot of people who don't even know that we sing it and they're surprised by it every high holidays. We sing this thing. You've been coming to high holidays for 10 years. You didn't notice. Well, no. Um, so yeah, it's like not everybody likes every single thing. And it's very hard for some folks to let go of the words. And you can hear it every time we do not say shalom, right? So we do not say shalom. And during high holiday services, 50% of the room is saying the traditional lyrics because it's like your brain turns off and you just do it. And the other half of the room is trying to figure out what it is we're singing. And the choir is singing the thing that the choir is singing and other people are trying to keep up or they just kind of give up and they go, Yase Shalom, and they go with it. I think there's a piece also that I want to bring into it, which is what's the point? Why are we doing it? You know, I think that's, a question that we rarely tackle what is this doing for us like why whether you want to use those words or new words or new music or old music why and so if we're talking about kids education maybe it is the parents feel this is important for them to know who they are and how do you make that happen is that the goal behind what we're doing? Or is it spiritual? And I put that word in quotes because I understand the aversion to suggesting that there's anything happening beyond chemical reactions in your body. I think it's only chemical reactions in your body. But that said, there's still a good feeling when you're singing a song that you love with a whole bunch of other people that you like. Um, is that the goal? Is the goal to come together with other people physically in a room and feel good? right? Um, that to me is an important goal. And we don't promote it like that. We don't say Shabbat services or Havdalah services, because you will feel better afterwards than you did beforehand, right? That to me is the goal. And if that's the goal, then the words matter less, right? Is the goal, the principle that we stand on, and we're coming together as a group of like-minded like people to express our value. That's a good goal too. And then maybe a part of it is, are we articulating why we're doing it? So, you know, in these conversations, I always fear that we're going to, that we're debating semantics and not purpose. 
And I want to bring the purpose back into that conversation because I think the big challenge is a lot of people are coming to this with different purposes in mind and it's not a conversation. So we don't know where people are coming from, but I do think a lot of it is folks are just like, I got to give my kids some Jewish education. I can't give them what I got because it was awful and I don't believe it. So maybe this will work, um, but you're not doing it exactly like I want you to do it. Right. And instead we can kind of take a step back and say, here's the purpose. Your kids will be connected to something larger than themselves, not, Spiritually, people wise, right? They'll be connected to their heritage, to this other group of people who are like minded, et cetera. Like, so I feel like a way around all of this is to kind of talk about what's the point? What are we trying to do with it? And as both shameless self promotion and humble brag, I guess, yeah. um, when our Kol Nidre service from this year is available on YouTube, because it was streamed, but it's not up there yet, we work with a, a Unitarian church to make that available. Um, Kol Nidre is not a high attendance service for us. About 50 people. Which means that I turned it into a discussion and the entire theme of the high holidays was why am I here? Why are we here? And so I did the thing that you can do when there's 50 people in the room. I turned it around and said, why are you here? And so there is a discussion of Mahar members, a ton, it's not everybody, of Mahar members, including some of them who brought their kids who are teenagers and all of a sudden, it's like they're saying these things that you never heard them say when they were Sunday school students, but, you know, they're not Sunday school students anymore, um, that really were great for people to hear and to exchange with one another. So I just want to, I, I kind of like when the quiet part's said out loud, because I'm not always great at figuring out the quiet part for myself. So if you tell me what it is, I'm, I'm good. So I wanted people to say the quiet part out loud, which is, did you come so that you could spend 20 minutes doing humanistic versions of al right? right? One of the Yom Kippur con confessionals. Is that why you're here? Or are you here for some other reason? Why are you here? Right. And, and just to follow up on Diane's point about music, music really does do it for me. And I know it does it for you as well. And... I think we can get better just movement wide on highlighting the music and making it better. And um, again, the words can be the words, but that's kind of not the whole point of the feeling that music gives. And I think that could be more of a strength than, than it is in certainly some of our communities. Um, uh, Peter and then Jody. Uh, earlier, thank you. Earlier in the conversation, you briefly mentioned about, I think if I heard correctly, about 107. My question really is about, is it maybe your personal policy or your congregation's policy, policy or maybe others in the country to uh, issue a statement of a tragedy or some significant uh, event? Uh, because I think many of us 10 days ago received a lot of emails from various Jewish and non-Jewish organizations um, reflecting the first anniversary of 10-7. So, Jeremy, the question is, did you or do you believe or does your congregation um, do these kind of statements on tragedies? And I'm hopeful, even celebrations, if that's possible. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that Mahar does. One of the things that's interesting about Mahar, I'm one of these, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I like to read articles of incorporation and bylaws. Mahar's bylaws have a statement of purpose. You do not have to have a statement of purpose for many, for many incorporation and bylaw documents, but Mahar has one. And it reads like it's the friggin' Jewish Brookings Institution. The purpose of Mahar will be to provide community and develop ideas and advance the ideas like, like we're a think tank, which means that Mahar does issue statements. We have a complex policy for getting a statement out the door or for signing on to a particular cause. Um, and, and the policy exists in order to ensure that I'm not the person making that decision for the congregation. I can have an idea, I send it to the social action committee, they send it to the board, it gets discussed, we send it to members, it looks like federal rulemaking. If you've ever been involved with federal rulemaking where you gotta like get public feedback, right? It's a very complex process. Um, it is not fast. Yeah, Peter asked, how quickly? Uh, hmm. 
Um, sometimes we can do it quickly and it's a temporary thing, but a permanent thing is a longer process, right? I don't want to go into it other than to think uh, it, it, it's cumbersome, um, but it's there so that I'm not deciding everything. For 10.7, we did release a statement. Um, sometimes you release a statement and people are just surprised that you haven't said that thing yet. Because of course we believe this. Um, and so that was part of what happened with the statement we did release for 10.7. It was, we have to release a statement. And when we did, when we finally got it processed all the way through, there were people like, we didn't say anything about this yet. And then there were people who were like, oh, this is a good statement. And then there were a few folks who their politics either are a little bit far to the right or to the left and didn't really love the statement that we made. Um, we did do, really the day after the attacks, I just used the power of Zoom to have a large congregation-wide Anybody who wants to come and we want to discuss how we're doing with this, we did. And I'm very explicit when we do this that I want you to talk about your feelings. Stop talking about policy. We live in D.C. Our discussion isn't going to change anything. How are you feeling? How are you feeling? How are you doing with this? When we came back to the anniversary, we did not issue a statement for the anniversary. On the 7th, we did do a discussion like the one that I had done last year, um, which was pretty well attended for a Monday night, right? That's kind of the proviso you got to put on it when 15 people show up is it's Monday night. Um, and then rather than the congregation issue a statement, I used my Yom Kippur talk. I put it into our memorial service rather than have it someplace else. And the talk was, again, we can't fix this sitting in this room, but how are you feeling about this? Because it's so easy, Mahar folks, humanistic Jews in general, we think a lot and we don't get out of our heads well sometimes. And so my goal is always get you from here to here. How are you feeling? And we did that in that community setting where I didn't ask people to solicit, but I wanted to navigate through for folks the tensions, right? We're really unhappy with the Israeli government. At the same time, Hamas really wants every Israeli dead. So how do you navigate that, right? Is it inevitable that something like 10-7 happens and does that make it okay? No. Does, our, does the Israeli government's response seem okay? Well, no. I can't fix this for you. I want you to sit with how bad this feels and think about what think about what that means for you and what that means for us and what you do next based on just how hard this is. It's such a it's a great approach and I really appreciate it. I mean the lovely thing about statements is they take forever, they make nobody happy and they have no impact in the real world. But be, bring people together to talk and that's the strength of us having these communities in the first place and the purpose of it as opposed to just yelling at people on the internet at random so i really appreciate that answer and we can do i think one more question rabbi jody hi jeremy hi jody this is such a rich discussion and so important. Um, and, and I want to sort of get back to where it was before your last answer, which is, is such a meaningful answer, um, which is to say that, um, okay, I don't know, my computer was telling me something weird, um, which is to say that as humanistic Jews, we stand for something. And that's okay to say institutionally, we are, we are not going to do what you might be used to. We stand for something. And my own, I came from the conservative movement, um, didn't understand you know, anything despite all my years of Hebrew school. Um, and my son was raised as a humanistic Jew and when he went to college, he's 40 now, but when he went to college and he came home at Thanksgiving and he said, you, that somebody, maybe Jeremy, it was you said, you know, you know what you left. I don't even know. 
and I feel it feels strange to me when he went to Hillel or whatever. I think the work to be done is to get Hillel to move not not theologically to where we are, but to be more welcoming, to offer more options, to be able to say, you know, th that that we're offering a humanistic option potentially, um, that educating our kids to be secure in their humanistic Jewish identity is valid. I think that the liberal branches of Judaism and humanistic Judaism in particular, we tend to lean right when we're in settings that involve multi-denominations and the right never wants to move left. But nonetheless, it's very important that we have a seat at the table and to be able to clearly articulate what we stand for. I did a bar mitzvah years ago and a man came up to me afterwards and he said, I've been going to these for 40 years and this is the first one I ever understood. And that was heartwarming and heartbreaking at the same time. So for people to be able to, to go and just simply say, I'm doing Jewish instead of deriving any meaning from it, that's an empty experience. Um, and then just briefly what you said about educating the kids as far as where they, um, when they're going to go into other congregations. Um, theoretically, I'd like to do the same thing. Practically, I don't even get the same kids every week because, because of sports and this and that. So if I'm dedicating a particular time to do it because I don't, I only have them for two hours and I'm only going to do that for 27 weeks of a year. I can't spend a lot of time teaching about other what other denominations do. And if a kid misses that day, then they're not going to know what's going on in other in other congregations. You know, sometimes I've had I've had students um, who said to me, I'm going to my cousin's bar mitzvah. What can I expect? And then I've had that conversation with that student. Um, but, you know, we just we just don't have the time to teach everything to everybody. I think that if we give them a good foundation, then they're gonna feel secure in who they are. They're gonna understand that there's value, even if we're different. There's, It's not a Jewish food chain and we're not at the bottom. And I think that that's a really important message for our kids to, to understand. And that when we as clergy show up, that we get a seat at the table, that is an educative experience. So I try my hardest to be able to participate in the interfaith Thanksgiving service every year. And there are a couple rabbis who, who do. I'm the only humanist who does. And, you know, my voice, I will not allow my voice and my perspective to be drowned out by a fully otherwise theistic service where everybody's doing other readings. So I thank you for approaching this topic because I think it's really, really important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will put in a plug for uh, a, a pilot program that we're doing now called Huge Jews on Campus. We have coordinators at Sarah Lawrence College here in Westchester, New York, and at University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, two very different sized campuses. And in both cases, the Hillels have been very receptive. And I see that Rabbi Miriam just put in the chat that the Hillel at her granddaughter's college is also, they know who the Jews are. And they know that even though as an organized denomination, we have many more people to reach. But when you look at who the Jews are out there, there are half or more aligned with our philosophy of life. And so Hillel is more than happy to use our approach to reach them if it's coming from the kids themselves. If it's coming from SHJ, they don't care. But if it's coming from young people on campus themselves, then Hillel will absolutely want to empower them to do it. So that's been the goal with setting up huge use on campus to both have their own space to be themselves at all times, but also in the same way that it's like a microcosm of what SHJ and, and our communities should be to the larger Jewish community. If they want to be genuinely pluralistic, we have to have a voice at the table. So hopefully we'll be able to do this on other campuses as well. If folks here have connections to young people on college campuses who may want to take this on, we are ready to roll it out to other campuses as well. So 
um, thank you for bringing that up. It's really important. And I really want to thank you, Rabbi Jeremy, for uh, sharing that story with us and your experiences. It's really powerful and um, really informative for us as a movement to, to hear from, from you. So thank you for that. Thank you. Great. So we will be back in the coming months. Keep opening your constant contact emails from me if you if you get them if you don't get them be in touch uh, make sure but obviously you're here so you got the message and um otherwise i hope everyone has a very good sukkot if you're celebrating and all the other jewish holidays that are coming this month there's a couple more um and i'm sorry for the folks who are just joining us because it's over so sorry and bye <laughs> you can find this on youtube in a couple of days see ya